Hi everyone, this is Dr. Gail Carson. Welcome to Living Regret Free, a program that shows you how to live a better and more joyful life. As an added bonus, I invite you to listen to an introduction to my Mindset Matters program, which ties into this so well. Go to www.sobmindset.com. It's free and I know you will enjoy it. If you'd like to contact me personally, drop me a line at gailcarson13 at gmail.com or go to my website, www.spunkyoldbroad.com and sign up for my weekly newsletter. My guest today is Elizabeth Prather. She's been a successful C-suite executive in healthcare management and worked in the nonprofit and travel industries. Stress and burnout brought Elizabeth to meditation over 25 years ago while working her way up the corporate ladder to vice president. She left the corporate world and for many years divided her time between work and immersion in meditation training and retreats. And in 2010, she committed to a full-time three-year silent meditation retreat in the high desert of Arizona. Lucky for us today, she is speaking. So welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, Gail. It's great to be here. You know, I don't think I could do a three-year retreat anywhere, <laughs> although I feel like it sometimes now with what's going on, but I don't think I could uh, do a three-year retreat where you, you, were, you were silent that whole time? Yes. Um, I, we had like a couple of breaks. There were five of us that were doing our own individual retreats. And there were like about four or five times in three years where we could come together from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and talk if we wanted to. <laughs> so basically, yes, everything was taken care of by writing. And uh, yeah, it was a real immersion. And, and I have to say, even within my own communities, it's pretty rare. It's, it's, it's like what we call a, getting a Ph.D. in mind training is what I've, it was what I've begun to call it, because that's the only way to compare it. You know, you're talking to someone who does not meditate. I exercise every day, but I don't meditate. But yet I think, and that's my own opinion, I think my meditation takes form in the uh, situation when I'm sitting down, my cats are in my lap, and I'm stroking them and petting them. And to me, that's the best thing in the world. So um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in all the things that you have to say today. Now, you're talking about, first of all, your symptoms of high stress and burnout as you went up the corporate ladder. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm curious about that. I never worked in a corporation. I have always worked for myself. So all these years, and it's been a long time because I've been in business for 60 years, uh, I've never ever uh, worked for anyone else. So what were your symptoms like? Because I know working for myself, there's enough <laughs> stress. I never, I don't think I had burnout, but I'm sure there were stressful situations because that's what's called growing a business. And I, I did, I grew my first business from the age of 21 to seven offices and 350 people, which is enough to cause you stress. So tell us about your journey. Yeah, thank you for asking. And, uh, you know, in relation to your journey, you know, the corporate world is is not dissimilar in many ways to the entrepreneurial journey uh, in that, you know, there is, you know, chronic stress and there is a distinct difference between being stressed and then being burned out. And so, you know, my journey was, you know, I kind of bought into this kind of hard work ideal. You go to university, you get a good job, you be successful and you're going to be happy. And so, the way I looked at that is I went to UC Berkeley and then I found this career track in healthcare management and it was really the business of healthcare. So I worked in mental health managed care and I really enjoyed my job. Um, and until I was about a director, I remember I was a director level and then I started going, wait a second, this isn't really, I'm not really that happy. Uh, and I was really exhausted. I think my symptoms were really exhaustion kind of chronic irritability, which was not natural for me as a human being. Um, I just found myself, you know, kind of snapping and more irritable. Um, and eventually when I was promoted to vice president, that's when things started getting really rough. Now, back then I didn't even, burnout is more well known now. Um, and of course the word's been around forever, but 
you know, when you're burnt out, you really, a lot of times you don't know you're burnt out. And so what I was feeling was numb. I was just, I got to this point where nothing was of interest. I was emotionally disconnected. And that's when it was kind of uh, my whole body and mind just said, this is too much. And what was happening is I was working 60, 80 hours a week. I didn't mind working for someone else. I mean, I would never do it again. Once I left, it was like, uh, you know, the corporate world is, was done for me then. Uh, but I have a soft spot in my heart, as we'll, I'm sure, talk about, because now my passion is to work with executive women and to help them with their stress and burnout. So what happened to make you realize that your life wasn't going the way you wanted it to, and that you were going to live your life on your terms and not what society expected. And of course, it's interesting, Elizabeth, because um, I guess I never did what was expected. I mean, I was kind of always the black sheep in my fa family because I never did what I was supposed to do. Uh, but I knew, I knew from an early age, I used to say to my mom when I was what, uh, for first of all, I always knew I was going to have a career. When I was like five years old, I knew that. And when I was eight or nine, I said to my mom, I can never work for anybody else because I can't do what other people tell me to do when I know it's stupid. So um, I always planned on, on being in my own business, although I wasn't sure exactly what size and shape it was going to take. But I always created my own jobs from the age of 13. So what do you think uh, you did to live a happy and successful life free of regrets? Yeah, I, I think what I what happened in my corporate life is that when you get to a certain point, I, I can't even, there's one defining moment. I remember I had, I, I grew up in Los Angeles and I had transplanted over to Washington, D.C. for promotions. I came back to L.A. for the vice president job and I was standing in my beautiful office overlooking the bay in Marina del Rey and I remember just going to my desk, putting my head in my arms and starting to sob. And so it was like, it was just like everything had built up to this certain point and I just said, this is it, I'm done. And so what happened is I actually took um, a huge break and my break took the um, form of going to India and Nepal with a backpack. I really needed a break and I loved to travel, but I had two missions on this particular trip. You know, I like you, I definitely love working. It wasn't like I didn't want to work. I just needed a break. And of course, I still have my two missions, my to-do list when I went on my vacation, which was ironic. But one of them was to have fun, of course. So I trekked in the Himalayas. I was on the beaches of Thailand. Um, but the other mission was to dive into meditation, which I had dabbled in when I was in the corporate world. And I knew it was of interest. And I had some friends who'd gone to this particular monastery in Nepal, actually, called Kopan Monastery. And I did my first 10-day meditation retreat. And it was one of those kind of life-changing moments where I knew, like, oh, my gosh, this is so incredible. It was amazing in that I felt a peace and serenity that I had never felt before. And so from that began this journey of, you know, just delving into wisdom teachings and doing retreats and teaching meditation myself and not necessarily knowing that I was going to teach it later uh, because I just became more aligned with what was what I wanted to do and what I wanted to do was travel. And so I got a job working as a tour director in the travel business. So for 15 years, for about half to three quarters of the year, I worked in either Europe or India and Nepal and I ran uh, tours for a high-end tour company, so a luxury tour company. So when I wasn't doing that, then I was continuing my spiritual practice of meditation. So I, my life began to be this mix, this parallel of, you know, you know, delving into this inner world of understanding myself and where the happiness comes from and being in aligned with work. And then from that, in 2010, I did the three-year silent meditation retreat because I really am just I'm kind of a geek on wanting to understand the mind. It's kind of funny. I love the science of it. But back to kind of your, your meditation, which is being with your cats or taking your walks and all of that, I currently work on really bringing it into a practical 
I bring meditation practically into the world. So when I work with my clients, I'm asking them to meditate for 10 minutes a day. And then we have all kinds of mental strategies and mindful tips to try and develop the habit. So my superpower is helping people just develop the habit. I think that's one of the hardest things. Um, but, you know, you're doing it, you know, whatever form it's taking, we need to step back and be still and allow that part of our brain, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is our rest and relax, to be activated because we're spending way too much time in this active part of the brain, which doesn't allow us to find that place of peace and stillness and, and happiness. But you know something, Elizabeth, I mean, very few people, well, many people go to India, Nepal, all, all those places to find uh, that special something. But very few people take three years to go to the desert and and uh, just be silent. I mean, I, I can't even imagine that. And of course, I would assume with all your travel, you didn't have that many possess possessions that you had to to worry about. Because when I think of, oh, my gosh. I mean, I have three homes and I have three everything in every home. And I'm thinking to myself, where is all this stuff going when I'm not here anymore? But what what are the biggest myths about meditation? I mean, what do you hear? You've got to hear a lot of things. Yes, it's a very good question. Um, the biggest myth is that that it, 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 that I debunk all the time is that you have to stop your that your stops thought, excuse me, your thoughts stop completely. So, you know, your thoughts are never going to stop until the last breath you take. So meditation is not about stopping our thought. It's, it's about gifting ourselves, allowing ourselves the gift of when our mind, is, our mind is distracted to just bring it back to the present moment. Most of us allow our mind to take us wherever it wants to go. It's running the show. Instead, what meditation helps us do is to bring us back to the center to be present. The other thing is that you actually need to go for the other myth is that you need to go away for three years to get any benefit out of it. The beauty of living in our time and age in this day and age is that the research is so clear that just, you know, 10 minutes a day of a, a mindfulness meditation practice can help us make better decisions help us be more creative, uh, help us to be, uh, to communicate better and to work with our emotions, be more emotionally intelligent. And so um, I think those are the, the main myths that I, that I can think of right now. You know, it's funny, Dan Harris, you know, who's a host on the morning, uh, Good Morning America broadcast, the weekend edition, he wrote a book called 10% and, uh, he said that's what, you know, you really have to practice with meditation and how it really helped him uh, overcome PTSD because evidently he had an, a major breakdown on air and that's when he discovered meditation and he said it has made all the difference in his life. So I believe that it's a positive. Um, I think learning how to do it is the most difficult part. So if you were to have a difficult conversation with uh, a family member or even a dear friend. Uh, how do you overcome regret about saying something negative that you might have said? Uh, that's a great question. And just I want to also bring to mind here that the other myth is that meditation or mindfulness is actually difficult because uh, I think it's it's not it's simple, not easy. And I think it can, and I think with our wording, we can um, really find uh, if we if we bring our minds to say, okay, yes, this is something that doesn't seem to be really easy for me. The process is actually quite simple. So, if I am actually uh, having a difficult conversation with a family member, for example, which just happened the other day, let's let's just say it right off. Uh, and what I do is just, this is mindfulness meditation. I just note it. I am aware that, oh my gosh, I had some anger come up. Then I just step back, take breaths. One of the first things that I suggest with all my clients is just a mindful pause, which is just inhaling for three to four seconds and exhaling for twice as long. 
So you're just inhaling for three or four seconds, exhaling twice as long. That's bringing your uh, rational brain back online, right? So in that situation with my family member, you know, just, okay, I just stepped back, took a few breaths, even as we were in the conversation, I just watched my mind become more relaxed. I let go, I just was aware, like I need to let go of this anger. And I tried to come to the conversation with um, an easier reframe. I was like just reframing, okay, I don't need to, to be in this angry place. And as you do the practice more often, the quicker you catch it. So the idea is like, no, I'm never not gonna be angry again or not irritated or whatever. It's that you begin to catch it quicker so that the time that you're having those negative emotions is less and less. Does that make sense? Absolutely, because you know, I, I know, and I'm gonna kind of go off on a little tiny tangent here, but I was always um, not taught, but I don't know where I read it, but I did get it from somewhere that, you know, when you're feeling nervous or when you're feeling anxious or when you're not sure, take a very deep breath and just blow it out slowly, take a deep breath. And I do that, for example, when there's turbulence on an airplane or, you know, things like that, or there's a situation, but the deep breathing is very similar to what you just said. And I've been doing that for years. It's so, exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting that it's very, very similar to that. So what, what other mental qualities help you deal with regret gracefully, do you think? Uh, just the thing that meditation has helped me with is just the ability to respond appropriately instead of reacting. Kind of similar to what we're talking about, but kind of more of this a general um, view of it. Um, I love the quote by Viktor Frankl. He was a psychiatrist who was in a concentration camp, wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning when he came out. And he said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in that response lies our growth and our freedom. So mindfulness, any kind of stillness practice helps us to just stop be aware, and we do that through the breath. As you were saying, you were doing that, you know, you're probably doing that naturally now after all these years, who knows when you learned it, right? Uh, and also meditation, you know, helping me to deal with regret in particular um, is just getting off of, you know, the autopilot. We, you know, with certain relationships, um, well, I'll bring up one in with my father. My father was an invalid he had a stroke by the time he was in his mid fifties. And I say my biggest regret in my life is not spending as much time with him as I did, right? And so, you know, what I worked with in letting go of that regret is to forgive myself for that. Um, just, and you know, spend a little bit of time reviewing it and then the important key point that I found in this four point process that I actually use with my clients on regret is gratitude for what I've learned for that situation. So, you know, I, you know, I learned that, you know, yes, I don't need to, I don't need to forgive myself. You know, I did my best. My parents were really big on not letting us children change our lives. I have three siblings and they said to us very clearly, it's like, cause I was 19 at the time when he had a stroke and he became an invalid, paralyzed on one side, lived in a convalescent home during the week and he came home on the weekends. And my mom was very big when I was in college, like, no, you're not gonna come home every weekend. You're not gonna do that. So she was really, you know, it giving us permission to live our lives. I chose to be a little regretful later on. But when I started thinking about it and really I have no regrets anymore about that, I just feel like I learned, I learned from that. My brother became ill. He had a stroke. He eventually ended up, unfortunately, dying from it very quickly, unlike my dad. But I was in that situation, like, I'm not going to have the same regrets. I'll spend the time with my brother that was needed. But unfortunately for him, um, he didn't, you know, he was around only a little bit of time after his stroke. And then the, the key is, and this is with any kind of practice that we're trying, right? You know, I, I was saying it's, simple practice to just, you know, breathe, learn to breathe, but we need to be patient with ourselves. So that's kind of key too with regrets. It's just being patient with ourselves 
as we get over, because some, some things we do are pretty harmful, right? Whether things we've said, you know, some people have done things very harmfully with their bodies. Um, so it's not necessarily an easy process, but that would be a process that I go through with my clients. Wow. Um, it's, you know, it's so interesting, Anne. I still am trying to wrap my head around three months, three years of <laughs> silence, but uh, I want to ask you a question, and it has to do with possessions. Um, I'm thinking, and this is a presumption on my part, I'm thinking that you're a person who may not need or want a lot of possessions. And I think a lot of people work towards having possessions. But being that you've lived in uh, foreign countries, that you conducted these tours, that you were... Uh, in a situation where, you know, you, you were fairly mobile, and then, of course, the three years in the desert. Uh, how do you feel about possessions? Uh, that's an excellent question. I definitely had many possessions as I was in the corporate world. And um, I think there's two things. Number one, just relative to possessions, there's nothing wrong with possessions. Um, in the kind of the view of finding happiness, one has to make sure that you're not attached in a negative way to those possessions, that you could let go of them at any given time. For example, a house can burn down. Uh, you can break a, you know, a piece of pottery that you bought for $10,000 tomorrow, or your kid could break it. So the idea is to work with understanding where happiness comes from. Absolutely you know, enjoying whatever wealth can give you uh, and being, um, being okay with less. Personally, I think what happened is I realized that I'm just a nomad by nature so that possessions are not where my happiness just comes from. And so well, that's, I guess, what I'm saying. I don't think that you need that to be yeah. happy. I certainly got that from everything you've been saying. Uh, and and I, I, I admire you for that. And I at this point in my life, feel the same way. I have given away a lot of things. I still have a lot of things, but I don't use a lot of things. So it's very interesting how kind of life changes. And the interesting thing also, I mean, I have some beautiful things that I know my son would really want, but in reality, my kids don't really want anything. You know, they, they it's not that they have so much, but they don't really want the things that I want. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you also, I want to talk about what you have for our, our listeners. First of all, you are offering a free 30-minute mindful living breakthrough session. So if any of you out there are uh, curious about all of this and how it works, she's volunteering to give you this wonderful 30-minute mindful living breakthrough session. Uh, the second thing, and you'd have to go to her calendar, but we're going to tell you how to do that. And then she also has another free gift, and that's five mindset reboots, taking you from stress and burnout to the top of your game. So why don't you uh, tell us uh, a little bit, Elizabeth, as to how to reach you, where to find you, where they can go to set up these appointments, and so forth. Because we have about three minutes left, and I want to make sure we get everything in. Thanks, Gail. So for the Mindful Living Breakthrough Session, the best way is to go to my website, www.thepraythergroup.com, that's P-R-A-T-H-E-R, -E and go to the contact and then get a hold of me there and I'll send you my calendar. It's easier. And uh, you can check out my website. Also, the op there'll be an opt-in box and you can get that five mindset reboots if you just put your name and email in there. And the other way to get that five mindset reboots resource is to go to www.bit.ly and forward slash five mindset reboots. I also have a Facebook group called Mindfulness for Professional Women, and you're welcome to join me there. So Mindfulness for Professional Women, the Facebook group, um, all the resources, the breakthrough session, and the resource guide you can find on my website, www.thepraythergroup.com. Wonderful, wonderful. Wow. Well, folks, uh, you can tell that Elizabeth is a very uh, worthwhile friend and mentor to have. And she is also 
you know, very experienced in the business world. So for those of you out there who are saying there can't be a, a match there, there definitely is. And so you just need to to really take a look at what she has to offer, see where she can help you. And, you know, I know that there are some of you in these times that are going through a lot and saying, wow, will it ever get back to the same? Uh, well, it never will get back to the same. So you have to find the new same and be able to deal with that and accept it and love it and work with it. So uh, all of that is is part of where we're going. So go to the Prather Group, P-R-A-T-H-E-R, uh, group.com. Go to her Facebook page, which is um, um, Mindfulness for Professional Women, and take advantage of her uh, a reboot little program that she's got for you that's going to help you with stress and burnout and get her 30-minute session. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being with us today. We really enjoyed it, and I wish you only the best in the future. Thanks so much, Gail. The same back to you. <laughs> Hi, this is Dr. Gale, and I wanted you to know I have a whole bunch of other things to offer you. If you go to spunkyoldbroad.com, you will see an array of SOB stuff for sale and all our latest products and additions. If you're interested in getting on TV, I have a brand new course, Get on TV. And if you want to start your own business, you'll want my SOB Guide to Business Success. I know you'll love them all. I guarantee it. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. I choose my guests carefully, so if you have someone you'd like me to interview, please drop me a line at gailcarson13 at gmail.com. In the meantime, check out my intro program, Mindset Matters, at www.sobmindset.com. See you next week.